Berger Singerman. He is a Florida-based business attorney with, with significant expertise with general corporate transactions, corporate and debt restructurings, and commercial real estate transactions with expertise in mergers, acquisitions, and dispositions of corporate businesses. Robert has helped me uh, help further my career by giving me some good advice on some of the real estate deals I've been working. Robert, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Jim. Good to oh, be here. Oh, thank you so much. Now, we're talking today, our topic is really about uh, the impact of the funding cuts in the mental health care industry. Can you set the table for, for us a little bit about what's been happening here if somebody's not been paying attention? Sure, sure. First of all, you just got to look at the country from a macro uh, view. You're looking at California, and there's actually several cities that, that are actually filed for bankruptcy. And even in our state, in the state of Florida, uh, funding for mental illness uh, care is at, frankly, all-time low. If you look at uh, just a recent study of the, the, the National Alliance of Mental Illness, NAMI, uh, that they did in 2009, which is the most current numbers we have, per capita spending in the state of Florida for mental illness services is about $41 a person. The national average is around $123 a person. Well, that's not even a copay. Yeah, it's just incredibly low for, for, for funding of mental health services. That's just, that's just unconscionable. I mean, some of these mental health people that, that come in there, they're some of our most at-risk people. So how is this issue being addressed in the marketplace today? Well, part of the challenge you have is, is that you know, connecting the, the bankruptcies in California is that both the federal, state, and even local governments just don't have the funds to raise funding uh, for these services. And so one, one thing that we're seeing is that uh, mental health service organizations are considering merging, combining with other organizations to frankly cut costs and to continue to provide those services at, at low, lower funding. Well, that makes a little bit more sense because they're they're gaining efficiencies, but that seems to be just a short-term fix. There's only so much cost efficiencies that you can have, so much, so much merger, so many positions that you can eliminate before you start getting uh, hitting meat and bone. Well, you know, it's it's true. Uh, and the other the other challenge with frankly the the merger, the combination uh, strategy, is that if the cultures are not similar, if they cannot work together, then it's, it actually could be worse than better. But just recently, in, uh, in July of this year, we had four nonprofits announce that they would merge into one entity called Grace Point in the Tampa area. And that's now, exactly what they did. So, and how's that been working for them? Is, well, that, is that sort of like a trend? It's, it, it, it probably will be, and we're seeing more of it. it, it it's, it's, it's too early to tell because, frankly, you announce it in July. It takes several months to have it actually close. And so, so we'll probably have to look back sometime next year to see how those efficiencies have come to, come to fruit. And so we'll see, however, more and more of mental health service organizations that will first step, from the first step, take the merger consolidation route. Now, who is somebody that would benefit from this kind of merger, acquisition, consolidation, uh, replumbing of the funding system of the mental health provision um, group, group of firms? Well, frankly, there are a host of business advisors that have, have advised for-profit companies to merge that, that now should be turning their sights on non-profit mental health services to provide those same merger and acquisition due diligence services to help them combine their, their companies, so to speak, their service organizations with other non-profits in that arena. So frankly, it's the, it's the merger and acquisition advisors that frankly need to turn their attention also to the nonprofit sector. Now, the nonprofits, they've always been uh, focused on grant writing, uh, getting uh, refunded, having their funding um, uh, every from year to year, I guess, zero funded, bringing their funding back from whoever their constituents may be. It seems to me that perhaps the talent pool in the 501c3 nonprofit world may not match up with some of the opportunities that you're talking about, how is that something that can be addressed by the business community? Yeah, see, that is a challenge because frankly, they've got the talent. It's just the talent is focused on serving the people who need mental health services. And frankly, their budgets have not been sufficient and capable enough to funding, if you will, the director of business development or joint venture development or merger and acquisitions. Obviously, that's not even part of their business plan. No. For, and for good reason. 
Yeah, but it seems to, well, their business plan up until now has been providing mental health services to the people that need it in our community. Exactly. They can't necessarily afford if they aren't what you would call private pay customers. Right. So how does somebody that's in the private pay business get their business acumen and their approach to making money and providing the services in a, in a cost-effective way that makes profits but still delivers high-quality services? How do they get all that wrapped up right. together? Well, it's because the business community needs to be the outsourcing. The business community needs to come alongside of the nonprofit community and say, don't hire the M&A person in-house. Don't hire the business development person in-house. We'll be that outsourcing service for you and provide that expertise for you to help you do due diligence, to help you locate other organizations and help you do the mergers and acquisitions. So then they don't need to have a, a significant cost line item added to their budget Instead, they can be flexible, find the appropriate consultant from the private sector. That consultant can bring their private sector expertise to the table, and this type of combination is the future of our healthcare industry? Exactly. Well, it's, and I would say, I, I need to be careful, it's not the future of 100% of the, of the industry, right? but 10, 20, 30, 35% of the funding, if that can come from business transactions, it would be a huge difference in, this, in the providing of care. Well, we're noticing that, there, that Medicare, Medicaid, you know, public funding for health care is, while it's not in the forefront of the debate, and I guess that's probably because both candidates don't want to tell the truth about what's going to have to happen, um, it seems like you've come up with a practical approach to the uh, situation and the opportunity that's created by the situation. But, but you know, Jim, frankly, the, the, merger, the, the merger, the consolidation, the joining of, of companies is a is a necessary first step but it's only a first step it's it's the low-hanging fruit well uh, what can we look for to happen after the combination um, more private is it more privatization no what what um, we're, we're always going to want to have these organizations continue with their primary mission okay but what we see coming and what we encourage and uh, the nonprofit mental health service companies to consider is to retool their current services that right. they're providing right. and and enter into business relationships with the for-profit community to provide another revenue source for their business. Now, do these not-for-profits know the for-profits? I guess they sort of uh, travel in the same professional circles. They go to the NAMI type conventions, stuff like that. So they must know each other. Do they mix, mingle, and match? I mean, or is it like kind of oil and water? They, you know, frankly, it hasn't been their focus. It hasn't been their focus. And so, frankly, both camps need to search out and, and, and find common ground to enter into those relationships. It sounds to me like then they need a consultant, an intermediary, some somebody that can help them identify the pitfalls, help them get comfortable if they're the 501c3 in the public, in the private sector. The private sector needs to understand the the nuances of the public sector. It sounds to me like like uh, there's good opportunities, but the people might be stuck dancing on different sides of the room. It reminds me sort of a fraternity party until mm -hmm. somebody gets in there and decides I'm going to dance with with that person over there, and then suddenly it starts. and And maybe that's this grace point thing is is the first couple dancing. Well, frankly, one of the reasons why we're here today is to to stimulate the community to start thinking like this, to start thinking about a, a forward way to provide additional funding for these services. Let me give you an example. Uh, insurance companies provide health insurance plans. These insurance companies have a challenge that as much as 35% of the costs under those plans could come from 10% of the population. The reason why is because you have someone that will have a mental health problem and also a physical problem. Well, this makes intuitive sense because I know that when I had my back problem a few years ago, uh, they, the people at UHealth made sure that I also got mental health uh, help because, not just because I'm crazy, everybody, but because uh, I was in pain and didn't know how to handle the pain. So I can totally see where you're coming from on this. Exactly. Well, the insurance companies realize that if, if we can help treat the mental illness, we can save money on the physical illness. It's the, it's the, it's the depressed diabetic that if he doesn't take his meds, we may have to amputate a toe or something. So it's very, very important in that setting to have a mental health service 
combined with the for-profit insurance policy to save money. Oh, sure. I mean, another example might be that somebody is on a medication and they take the medication for some particular uh, malady. The malady, when they take the medication, goes away, so they stop taking the medication. The malady comes back and they're on and off and on and off and on and off, and they just can't get it straight because they think that they're doing the right thing, but what they're really doing is a peak and valley. Yes, absolutely. So, so frankly, we think board members, boards and executives of mental health in, uh, uh, organizations need to be thinking outside the box of ways that they can maximize funding by entering, entering into these kind of business relationships. Well, this sounds great. Robert, I want to thank you for bringing this type of an opportunity to our listeners' attention, and I hope that you and Burger Serum will come back with more good, solid business ideas like this for our community in the future. Thank you so much for being a thought leader on the, on the health and wellness uh, industry here, and we look forward to having Burger Serum in here with us again and in the future as a sponsor on the show, and I want to thank you so much for being on today with us. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. It's my pleasure. We'll be right back after this short break with our good friend Rob Denton from True North Financial.